Okay, everyone. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. My name is Laura LeBurr and I'm a marine science educator at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems Exhibit. Welcome back to our second to last Career Dives Live Conversations in Marine Science. If you're new, this summer series highlights the career tracks, interests, and projects of our marine science professionals working with the Smithsonian Marine Station and the Marine Ecosystems Exhibit. A lot of you have done so already, but while you're joining, you can use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to let us know where you're joining us from. As everyone joins the webinar, I'd like to point out some of the features. You can use the Q&A box to ask your questions to our guest. The Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen and it's the one that has two speech bubbles. You can submit a question at any time. Please do so only in the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible at the end of our program and throughout, but please be patient with us as there might be a high influx of questions and we may not be able to get to all of them. If you ask a question and for some reason we aren't able to get to it, you're more than welcome to email us at smseducation at si.edu and we can follow up with you with an answer. There's another educator on the background to keep track of your questions. If you see a message in the chat box coming from an Aaron, that's from them. So throughout the program, you can use the chat box to send us messages and answer the, any questions that we have for you. But your comments, um, please keep them on topic and appropriate. So that's about all for the housekeeping. Today's program is gonna be roughly 40 minutes and I think we're ready to get started. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you this morning, Holly Sweat, a marine ecologist at the Smithsonian Marine Station. She specializes in cataloging biodiversity and understanding how microscopic and other small cryptic organisms, which just means that they're good at hiding, contribute to the structure and function of marine ecosystems. Holly, good morning and welcome to Career Dives. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for having me today. You're super welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Um, let's, get, let's get started. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. So how did you get first get interested in marine science? Sure. Let me start sharing my screen. Okay. Can you see that all right? Perfect. Great. So the beginning for me, like probably a lot of people in marine science, um, was actually nowhere near the ocean. I grew up in a relatively small town and it was completely landlocked, um, except for access to the Ohio River. And it was called Owensboro, Kentucky. And uh, if you are not a Kentuckian, or you're not familiar with that part of the country, then you probably don't know what much about Owensboro. Um, and you may have heard of it in a couple of different ways. Either you're a big barbecue fan and you've been to our international barbecue festival that we hold every year, or you're a diehard Johnny Depp fan and you happen to know that this is where he was born. Um, other than that, you probably haven't heard of it. It was a great place to grow up. Um, I got a great education there, but I needed to find exposure to the ocean to start my career path forward. Um, luckily, I was able to get that when I was two years old. Um, my family, like a lot of families, went to Florida and we did the Disney World thing and we did the beach thing. And um, I remember vividly at two, going to the beach, playing in the surf, getting uh, salt water up my nose. And that sting just burned that memory in my tiny little brain. And I was a goner from that point on. I loved the ocean. I loved anything aquatic. Um, and when I got older, I started realizing that you could make money at this and um, make a career out of it. And money is a little bit subjective, but you can make a career out of it. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. So for the life of me, I could not find pictures of that family vacation, but I did find a couple of pictures of me from uh, other points that year, just to kind of drive home how young I was whenever this memory was formed. So I don't remember these holidays. I don't remember these holidays for the next several years, um, but I remember that trip to the beach and how much it shaped me. So it was really formative for me. Even though I had chosen this career path in marine science and I did really well in my science classes and 
tried to learn more whenever possible. Most of the people that I knew um, would probably be pretty surprised that I wanted to go into this career path because most of my or all of my extracurricular activities were in the arts. I did a lot of um, performance art from uh, dancing and singing and playing musical instruments when I was really little and then theater later on also a lot of, of visual art so needless to say when it came time for me to declare a major and go off to college some people were really surprised that I wanted to pick a career in the ocean sciences I got comments like you don't really fit the scientist mold whatever that is um, so are, are you sure you're gonna do well or Maybe you want to go for a different career path, um, but I just pushed forward because I knew what I wanted. So I that is my childhood. <laughs> I think it's really interesting that you were so passionate about creative arts and people put you in that box and they didn't think that you could be as, I mean, first of all, this is what scientists look like, you know, um, we look very different and we're very diverse. And so what if we like creative arts and we, play the flute and we dance and we act. A lot of people I know are in improv groups and have music as a hobby. And I think music really sets you up to having that very analytical, super logical mindset that helps people be successful in science. So um, you came back to Florida. You studied an undergraduate degree in marine science at Eckerd College. Uh, do you wanna tell us about why you decided to come back to Florida and then never leave? Sure. <laughs> Um, so, as you mentioned, I ended up at Eckerd College after some searching, and I did one campus visit, and just like that beach memory from my early childhood, I fell in love immediately, and I knew that's where I wanted to be. Um, Eckerd is on the Gulf Coast of Florida in St. Petersburg, and it's a small liberal arts college. At the time, they had less than 2,000 students, and they just offer an undergraduate program but they have a stellar marine science program. So it made sense that I would choose there. This is actually a picture of the marine science facility. So it's obviously a great location, um, but I also really loved the sense of community. I loved that because it was a small school, I had hands-on learning opportunities and I had direct access to faculty that I wouldn't necessarily have at a large university. And then I also love that they had a great study abroad and field course program. So I had never been out of the US before I went to college. And within a year of being at Eckerd, I was on a plane to Madagascar for a field course. And so I, I left the country with a bang, with a very long plane flight. Um, and it was amazing. I learned so much, my eyes were opened. And two years later, I took a trip to Costa Rica and I was blown away by that. So I can say hands down that my decision to go to Eckerd shaped who I am now and I wouldn't be the same person if I hadn't gone there. I studied a lot of different things while I was um, at Eckerd College and two of the, the subjects that really stuck out in my mind that I ended up loving and kind of shaped what I would study later on were botany and specifically phycology or the study of marine algae and also marine invertebrate zoology. Now marine invert zoo is a class that most people if they're marine biologists had to take. It's required and depending on where you go to school you take it at different times during your education. For me, it was what they call a weed out class. So it was offered our freshman year, very tough course. Um, and if you survived it, then you could go on in the marine science program. And I absolutely loved it. A big part of that class is going out and collecting live animals, bringing them back and observing them, drawing them, um, labeling their parts, trying to figure out how their, they um, function. And this is probably when it dawned on me why I didn't see a big break between the arts and the sciences. For me, it's all kind of the same thing. So much of the artistic expression we have comes from nature. 
And in observing that, I have a creative outlet. And the whole scientific process is a creative process, from uh, designing experiments to uh, letting people know what your results are. It's all storytelling. So I think that this was the moment when that really dawned on me. I was like, I don't have to choose between art and science. I can do it all. So that was great. <clears throat> I think this is a great practice too, like the act of just drawing an animal or a leaf or a plant. Um, if you are interested in marine science or in any of the sciences, you can always start now and start honing your um, creative process. But when you draw something and you shape it with your hand, you can really get a sense of like what it looks like and how it functions. Um, so to all of our budding scientists in the audience, um, my homework for you is to pick something, an animal or a plant, and try and draw it and understand like what are the, like if it's a leaf, you know, what are the veins? What do they do? Um, and you can get a parent to help you look that stuff up on the computer and, and label it like a scientific illustration like Holly's done. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and you can do that whether you're near the ocean or not. There's always stuff in your backyard, like you just said. Um, so yeah, that's a great idea. <clears throat> I wish I'd done more of that as a little kid. So while I was at Eckerd, I started trying to jump on any opportunities I could to learn more and get more experience. And this is something that I've kind of taken with me throughout my career. Anytime there's an opportunity, sometimes to my detriment, I'm like, I wanna do that. Um, and one of those was an internship at Moat Marine Lab in Sarasota, Florida. And one of the cool things about my internship there was that the timing was just right for me to see them prepare for exhibit a um, giant squid that they had been gifted. It had been caught by fishermen accidentally in New Zealand and um, they, it was donated to them and they were forming an exhibit around this 27 foot long invertebrate. And that was just a really cool thing to see um, because it was probably the biggest marine animal I had seen close up and probably the coolest to this day. <clears throat> Guys, drop us a line in the chat if you've been to Mo in Sarasota, Florida, and you've seen this giant squid. This is actually what the exhibit looks like now. So um, you can go there today and check out Molly the Mollusk. That's her name. So what I was really there for was to do an internship in benthic ecology. And benthic means bottom dwelling. Benthos is another word for, for seafloor. So it's a study of animals that live on the seafloor and on surfaces that are submerged in the ocean. And there were two groups of animals, organisms, that I started working with that completely paved my way um, to all of the stuff that I do now. And one of those is um, the benthic infauna. And these are worms and crustaceans and snails, small invertebrates that live in the sediment. And because they can't swim away like fish do whenever there's pollution or some other type of environmental disturbance, um, we look at them, we monitor them, and um, look at their biodiversity and abundance over time to see how healthy the um, ecosystem is. And another group are fouling invertebrates and fouling organisms. And fouling basically just means encrusting. And so these animals, instead of living in the sediments, they live on hard structures. And I started getting involved in this research, looking at the Asian green mussel invasion that was happening in Tampa Bay at the time. This mussel is from the Indo-Pacific. It was brought to Florida. Everybody was worried about it because it was just taking over surfaces. Um, <clears throat> so both of those experiences were probably my first big research efforts and totally paved the way for what I do now. So whenever um, it was about time for me to wrap up my bachelor's degree, I decided that I wanted to take a little bit of a break before I went off to grad school to start um, applying some of the things that I learned. And luckily, my advisor in undergrad, she was a former Link, Smithsonian Link fellow and she knew about this opportunity at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems exhibit. She gave me the job announcement. It was the very last day it was open. I applied, 
and I got a job as an aquarist and educator at the exhibit. So I ended up spending the next five years working there. And the whole um, premise of the exhibit is to try to create model ecosystems. So you bring as much biodiversity as you can indoors for people to see, instead of it just being like a sterile fish tank environment. And whenever you try to recreate that, sometimes it comes with problems. You end up getting things like algae blooms in the tank, just like you would out in nature. And part of my job was to look more closely at what was happening um, associated with those blooms. And so I started taking scrapings of the, the glass and of the rocks and looking at what was there. And I started discovering these things. And these are diatoms. Um, they are single-celled microalgae. They photosynthesize just like your house plants. But what sets them apart is that their skeleton is made out of glass. And that's the clear part that you see right here. So this is actually a colony of individual diatoms that form this, this fan-shaped structure that's attached to a piece of filamentous algae. And for scale, this, this algae right here, this filament that it's attached to, is about the diameter of a thread that comes from your clothing. So they're very tiny, but super important. They produce oxygen, they cycle nutrients, so I fell in love with these guys and I said, it's time for me to go back to grad school. I wanna study this microscopic stuff. And that's what I ended up doing. <clears throat> so Holly, we had a really good question and I think you are probably the best person to answer this question. Um, and audience, if you wanna ask questions to Holly or throughout while we go along, feel free to use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. But Rebecca wants to know, do marine biologists study only ocean life or do they also study river and bay life also? That's a really good question. Um, yes, we study river and bay life also. So for example, um, I have a big project that's going on right now where we are monitoring the Indian River Lagoon estuary where the Smithsonian is located. And a lot of that estuary is marine. It's um, full strength seawater. It gets a lot of um, flow from the Atlantic Ocean. But the other parts of that estuary are um, brackish. So they're lower in salinity, a mix of salt and fresh. Or um, to the west side, it's actually completely fresh water. So we actually do look at freshwater sources that affect coastal environments, marine environments. So, um, and we look at bays and um, uh, all sorts of different water bodies along the coastline. So yes, definitely. Cool, and I think that's a good segue. We're gonna transition into some of that conversation a little bit later on. So stay tuned if you wanna learn more about uh, how dynamic our watersheds are. Um, Christopher asks, is the Drawing an Ocean Animal Project mandatory? <laughs> and I wanted to say, that's a great question. No, it is not. I just was saying if you wanted to do a study at home, um, just as an exercise for fun. And if you do, you're welcome to share them with us on Facebook or Instagram, but it's definitely not, definitely not mandatory. Um, Holly, we're going to transition now into talking about your master's and doctorate degrees. And I think it's really cool because everything that you've done so far, the work that you did in your undergraduate and the work that you did with the Smithsonian at the Ecosystems Exhibit um, kind of encouraged you to look into schools and know what the projects that you wanted to go into are. So you went to FIT, which is Florida Institute of Technology, which is in Melbourne, Florida. Can you share with us your research and how you decided to, to go there? Sure. So with a lot of um, moments in my career, it was a bit fortuitous how I got to FIT. Um, I got to the Smithsonian from Eckerd because my advisor was connected to the Smithsonian. I got from FIT to FIT from the Smithsonian because my future advisor was connected to the Smithsonian. So we're all um, a family, really. <clears throat> and I chose FIT because of that connection. My advisor, Kevin Johnson, was a former postdoc of the Marine Station. But also I knew um, FIT's reputation as a really good science and engineering school, and the fact that it was local. They were doing work on the Indian River Lagoon, and 
I had formed an attachment to the area. I had a big appreciation for the estuary and I wanted to continue to work on it. So, and also it was a small school like Eckerd. So I could continue to get that kind of hands-on experience. So that led me to FIT and for the next eight years, doing a master's, a PhD, and taking a year off in between to um, teach as an adjunct professor and work on campus, I ended up studying a ton of different organisms. And this is just kind of a smattering of the things that I looked at while I was there um, during my programs. And everything you see here is less than an inch long. It's all tiny marine life, but it's all so, so important. Um, from producing oxygen, to cycling nutrients, to uh, and cleaning up pollution, to providing a food source for bigger animals in the ocean, we wouldn't have the marine environment that we know and love if we didn't have these small things that we often neglect. <clears throat> Holly, I think this is a good time um, if you could go back to that slide because sure. someone wants to know, did you get to study dolphins and whales? And I think this slide is a good picture um, of the things, the microscopic things that you do study. Yeah, so um, I actually was involved in a manatee um, conservation internship when I was in college. That was probably the only marine mammal experience I had um, as a formal like work program. But uh, all the stuff that I do study affects those larger animals. So for example, dolphins feed on uh, schools of, of fish and a lot of the fish that they're eating feed on plankton, things like you see pictured here. So if we didn't have these, we wouldn't have the dolphins, for example. Um, so yeah, I worked on them in sort of a roundabout, indirect way, I guess. Everything is connected. Right. <clears throat> so um, I mentioned that I took a year off between my master's and my PhD. And in that time, I, I taught, but I also worked in a lab on FIT's campus called the Center for Corrosion and Biofiling Control. And this is led by Dr. Jeff Swain. And their group is focused on looking at um, biofouling that occurs on uh, ship hulls and other artificial structures and the effect that that fouling has on the maritime industry and um, how it can corrode structures. And so one of the big things that they look at are biofilms. And if you've never heard of a biofilm, um, that's okay but you deal with them every day because um, you know, any time that you've probably spent a little bit longer than you should in between brushing your teeth, you've felt a biofilm on your teeth. So it's that, that gritty, slimy feeling. It's just a, um, a community of microbes in your mouth that's bacteria. In the marine environment, it's bacteria and lots of other microscopic organisms. And they form this um, somewhat invisible or, or hard to see coating um, until they get really abundant. And then you can start to see them here, like on the ship hull. So because they're microscopic, they're not a huge problem, but the problem for the maritime industry lies in the fact that they end up producing all of this biofouling if left untended because they form this really good foundation layer that attracts larvae from everything else that wants to settle on a surface. So they send out all these cues, all these smells into the water and the larvae that are drifting around trying to figure out where they want to land can smell it and they're like, this is a good place to settle. And so if you don't take care of the biofilms, you end up with a boat that looks like this. Just like if you don't brush your teeth, often it turns into cavities and gingivitis and it can escalate into these larger issues, right? Exactly, yeah. <clears throat> so I got really interested in biofilms, um, both from this management perspective, the supply perspective, but also looking at them for the benefits that they provide to marine environments. 
So we just call fouling fouling because it's, I think I said earlier, it's um, organisms that grow where we don't want them. But the same process occurs in the natural world, um, in natural environments, and it's to the benefit of the oceans. And so microbes are forming these biofilms and it's attracting corals to coral reefs. It's attracting sponges and all sorts of different life to uh, mangrove roots. And this is how artificial reefs are formed a lot of the time. So I was interested in looking at biofilms in more of like an inclusive context at the harm that they cause, but also the benefits that they provide. I think something that's really cool about your work is that just like you said, um, you know, biofilms are often are a part of this fouling communities, which we talked a little bit in Dean Janiak's um, career dive series, but just like weeds that grow in our garden, oftentimes those weeds are actually like native plants that are super normal and healthy for pollinators and things to have around. And with the shipping and stuff, they're called biofouling because they're just like marine weeds growing on the bottom of the ships. And the reason it's bad is because it can slow them down and it can get in the way and clog up pumps and, and filters. So um, if you didn't know what fouling was, all that stuff is naturally in the ocean um, and just understanding how it gets there and how the communities form, I think, is going to lead us into your next segment of work, right? Right. Um, so I was lucky enough to get some funding to start my PhD research on this topic. I got a scholarship from uh, PEO International, and I got a Smithsonian Link Foundation graduate fellowship, which brought me back to the Smithsonian Marine Station again. Um, so I started looking at biofilms that were formed in ports and in marinas and how the microbes that form those biofilms are distributed. Are two marinas within the same port, do they have the same biofilms or are they different? Are two ports different? What happens when you move a biofilm from one place to another, um, like a ship would do? Is it, are they gonna survive? Are they gonna die? Um, and what does that do to help structure the community that comes after them. <clears throat> so these are just some pictures of, of me sampling biofilms from Port Canaveral, which is a, a major port that connects to the Indian River Lagoon. And um, I think that this was a time in my career where it really set me up for um, all of the experiences that I have now and my postdoc research, just trying to figure out um, what the role was of these microbes in the oceans. And this opportunity led you to being a postdoctorate researcher at the Smithsonian Marine Station where you're currently still conducting research. So can you talk about your current research at the station and what does a typical day look like for you now? So, First off, I ended up coming back to the Marine Station um, after my PhD was over. I was lucky enough to get a Smithsonian Marine Geo postdoctoral fellowship. And that was in um, 2017, I started doing that. And the whole idea of it was to look at microbial diversity and the distribution of these microbes that are foundations of all of our marine habitats to look at how they are distributed across different latitudes and in different habitats. So are microbes in coral reefs different from the ones you find in mangroves? Um, are the microbes that I find in the tropics in Panama different from those that I might find up in Virginia? And how does that structure the world, that, the ocean that we see? So I've been doing that for the past few years. What do you guys think in the chat? Do you think the microbial communities are different in temperate and subtropical and tropical? And which ones do you think might be maybe the most similar? So that led me on to my current position at the Marine Station, um, heading up the benthic ecology program. So I'm still doing a lot of work with microbes and microbiomes. Um, you might've heard about what microbiomes are from all the, um, the emphasis that's placed on it with gut health now. So if you take antibiotics and um, you start feeling a little bit queasy afterward, that's because you've killed off your gut microbiome. 
and you need to eat yogurt and, and things like that to reestablish the good bacteria that are in your gut. The same thing happens in the marine environment. So I've been looking at the, the ocean microbiome to see if it's healthy. I've also been looking at a whole variety of other benthic um, animal and plant groups. And so my typical day is just not typical. Um, in a normal year without a pandemic, uh, I can be in the field one day and then I'll be in the lab the next day then I'll be at my computer writing. So I really like that part of my job because you just never know what the next week is gonna bring. But um, it's been a little bit more challenging lately, obviously with the um, pandemic happening, but we're still finding ways to get out through social distancing and um, wearing face coverings. And so these are two examples of me hard at work recently. Um, going out in the Indian River Lagoon to collect in fauna and collecting sponges for a sponge biodiversity project that we have going on. So we're still finding ways to make it happen. Very cool. So we had some response. We had um, Sharon and Brock think that they would be similar, tropical and subtropical, probably more similar. And Sophie thinks that they would all be different. What is the answer, Holly? They're both right. Um, there are a lot of similarities. So if we look at, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute. If we look at the microbes that are in the ocean, some of them are what we call cosmopolitan. So they're found everywhere. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the poles all the way down to the equator, you would find the same species. Cool. And then others are super localized. So you have some, um, diatoms and some bacteria that are only found at certain latitudes. You have some that are only found in certain habitats. And then I'm sure, we don't know that much about it yet, but I'm sure that there are what we call endemic microbes that you would only find in very localized parts of the world. Very cool. And it's just understanding what's out there and comparing the, the micro, mi microbial communities um, at each location. And I think there's tons of potential for this work and opportunities for people. If, the, if this is fascinating to you and you want to get involved in understanding microbial, <laughs> every time, microbial <laughs> communities, I keep wanting to say microbiome, which it is, but okay, um, micro, mi microbiomes and the communities around them. Um, we have one more really good question from Siddhar about how is climate change affecting the biofilms? That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, so we're still trying to figure that out. There's a lot of research that's going into that right now. Um, <clears throat> looking at the role that pH plays on, um, pH and temperature change plays on biofilm formation. So as the planet warms, a lot of processes are accelerated, growth is accelerated. And so we would expect to see more biofilms forming um, as the oceans get warmer. And then as the oceans acidify, as the pH gets lower, um, that can change the structure of the biofilms too. So there may be some microbes that do really well under more acidic conditions, and then there's others that um, don't do so well. So what happens is when that community shifts, and you get different microbes in a biofilm, they're releasing different smells into the water column because there's different things there. Mm -hmm. And then the larvae of the clams and the, um, totally blanking out here, sponges, mussels, all of these things that are looking for a cue to settle down and metamorphose just like a caterpillar into a butterfly. Um, they are going to be picking up on different scents, so they may not be able to find the home that they need to find if the communities change. So it's still unclear what impact it's going to have on the marine environment. It's definitely something that we're researching. Yeah, and just continuing the work that you're doing and looking at the communities over time, it just like it's impacting, you know, ocean acidification impacts corals out of the reefs, it affects all the communities in the in the ocean, even the tiny, tiny microscopic ones. So that was a really great, great
great question. Um, you guys feel free to answer your questions in the Q&A. We're gonna take some at the end. Um, there's some great questions in there and we will get to them. But I really wanna ask you, um, Holly, did you have any influential mentors in your life and in your career? And what was the most valuable lesson that they taught you? Yes, so I, I'd have to say that probably um, people that I've worked with throughout my career, not just people that were ahead of me in, in their career path, but also people that came up alongside me. I've learned so much from, from so many of those individuals and I try to kind of take um, lessons that I've learned from them throughout my career, but probably the two that were the most influential um, were my dad and um, a woman named Sherry Reed, who if you caught Michelle Donahue's um, career dive last week, you probably saw her picture. If we did a whole string of career dives, she'd probably be listed as a mentor in so many of them. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, both of these people are not with us today, um, but the lessons that they taught me, uh, I carry with me every day. So the first is my dad, and he is a very hard worker. Um, he was always striving to do better and work really hard, and um, he owned his own business for most of my childhood. And he really instilled in me that you need to take a sense of pride in your work. You need to try to do your best because it um, reflects your character. It's part of who you are. And so it also provides you a lot of opportunities. If you are working really hard and um, you are trying your best, people are gonna notice that. And that can open up a lot of doors for you, even if you're not the smartest person in the room, even if you don't have that um, innate talent for something. Uh, working hard goes a long way. And conversely, if you're chronically lazy <laughs> and you don't strive um, to do your best, people notice that too, and that could be to your detriment. So um, work really hard was the, the message I got from him and then from Sherry, she was just a wealth of information. Um, you could go to her and say, I'm looking for this really weird, obscure snail. Where can I find it? And she'd be like, oh, you just, you go to this mangrove island and when you pull in, you walk to the right and over there you'll see a bunch. And she could tell you who at the Smithsonian um, worked on them. She could she did that with so many different things. If you didn't know, go ask Sherry and she could tell you. So she was, she knew so much, but she was never um, arrogant about it. She was never, um, she never made you feel silly for asking a question. And so what I got from her is just don't be a jerk. Like you're going to learn new things and you're going to um, absorb so much knowledge, but just try to be accessible to people and try to um, just not be pretentious about it. And that'll take you a long way in your career because nobody wants to work with a jerk and nobody wants to learn from a jerk. So just try to be nice to people. Yeah, and meet people where they're at. You know, you might have a really well-known background in this one obscure snail and know exactly where to find it, but <laughs> that's you and not everybody has that. And share, share your knowledge with others. I think that's really good really good advice. And also, I really loved what you said about, you know, mentors don't have to necessarily be someone who's a supervisor of you. They could be a peer or a colleague or a friend or a family member. So um, you can find mentors wherever and you can mentor wherever as well. I think that's really something super unique. Um, and people think it's always got to be someone who's a supervisor. And I don't think that's really a reality. No. Um, well, thank you so much, Holly, for, for sharing your career with us. It is on the 40 minute mark. So if you guys have to run, I just want to wrap up for you. But Holly, do you have some time to stick around and answer some questions after? Absolutely. Awesome. So, okay, everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Um, if you have to run, I just want to say next week we'll be conducting our very last of the Career Dive series for summer. Um, I will be interviewing Woody Lee, a captain and technician at the Smithsonian Marine Station. 
Woody is going to be answering some questions and building part of an underwater robot um, that you can make from home. So if you want to join us and find out more about that, you can find the registration links for our live stream um, on, face on our Facebook page. We share them every Monday. And you can check the chat box because one of our educators is going to be sharing the links with you for next week. And that, like I said, is going to be our last one for the summer. If you've stuck with us through all of them, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. But I think we're going to turn to some questions because we've gotten some really good ones. I just want to say, if you have a question, feel free to ask it. Um, please just make sure you're keeping your questions on topic and appropriate for today's career dive. So, Kalila, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Kalila. What? <laughs> Kalila? Kalila. Kalila. She's my intern, so I, hopefully I can. <laughs> pronounce her name right. <laughs> they want to know what has been the most challenging obstacle in your career path thus far and I think that's a great question. Oh that's a good one. A tricky one. Hmm. Or maybe what's been the most recent obstacle if that comes to mind faster. I think it's probably not just one obstacle. I think it's probably kind of a continual um, struggle. I think the, the more you learn, the more you kind of like doubt yourself and how much you know. Um, and so in marine science, you know, you've got to keep learning and it's a lifelong thing. And um, you also need to have confidence in when what you've learned. And so that can be a struggle for, I mean, that's something I've struggled with. And that's something that I think a lot of people that I talk to struggle with is just having that sense of, yeah, I learned that and I know that and, and, you know, let's move on, let's move forward. So that's probably the big thing for me. Yeah. Having confidence and, you know, not having to doubt yourself. I think that that goes for a lot. I mean, I feel like that too in my life. So it's like, yeah, I went to school for that. And I know about that. I could talk to you about that. <laughs> Right. And not being like, oh, let me just check with Google. It's like, no, I know, I know about that. Yeah. Um, Although Google's great. I'm a chronic Googler. If I I can't let a question lie. So if I have a question, I'm on my phone trying to find the answer to it and there's nothing wrong with that. No, I think fact checking yourself and your friends is really important. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sharon wants to know what do you think is the biggest threat to marine life and are you hopeful for a future um, for the future of ocean? of ocean life? I think all in all, the biggest threat to marine life are humans. And that comes in a lot of different shapes and, and colors. Um, there's so many things from uh, development and that brings pollution and threatens species. And um, there's, there's so many things involved in so many threats that are posed to marine life because of people. But I am absolutely hopeful. I remain optimistic that we can change and people can learn. And I think a big part of, of changing is to make making people feel empowered, like they can do something. Because it's, it's really easy to get overwhelmed. I think we all can feel that in our present day. So when you feel like you're powerless and you can't do anything to fix the problem, you're like, well, oh well. But there are ways that we can all um, make small changes to impact our natural world. And so if we can get that point across and, and educate ourselves and each other, then I definitely have hope for the future. Yeah, and there's really cool researchers and also, you know, humans are a part of the solution as well. We are, we are the part of the problem, and, but if we figure out what we're doing, and I think like what you said, it's about progress, not perfection. So you are one person and you're making a small change in your life, but think about the impact that your changes and the way that you present that to your friends and family, and then they start all enacting change. And I think on that, dare I say, microscopic scale, I think all of us can really um, enact positive change and, and, and just drive those conversations around it. So, and there's a lot to be optimistic for um, in science. If you're interested in um, finding out more, Smithsonian has an Earth Optimism 
series where you can follow along to some of the stories that we feel optimistic about. Um, and there's a lot of really cool ones. So I definitely encourage you to check that out if you want to know more. My friends, we have time for two more questions. Um, one, I think you're going to really appreciate, Holly, but the first one is, are there specific species that help scientists determine the health of the marine environment? And I think this is really cool for the work that you're doing. Um, Elizabeth says, for example, mayflies and stoneflies are indicators in a freshwater environment, but maybe you want to talk a little bit more about um, species in the benthic habitat in the Indian River Lagoon? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, some of them are very obvious because they're big habitat forming organisms. So um, a lot of the issues we've been facing in the Indian River Lagoon estuary, like a lot of estuaries, are recent loss of seagrasses and death of oysters. Um, and these two things are obviously, um, if they're present and they're healthy, then you know that the environment is doing better. So those are ones that you can easily see. And when we start to have um, death of those things, then the whole ecosystem suffers. But then there's a whole lot of, of smaller things that you may not uh, readily see that can also be biological indicators, um, is what we like to call them. And I'm thinking of one in particular that I've been researching. It's this tiny snail. It's about the size of my pinky nail. Um, but it is a, a major food source for a lot of organisms, and it's really dominant in certain parts of our estuary. And it was really booming for many years at some of the sites that we monitor um, quarterly um, for the last 16 years. And then we got um, a couple of hurricanes that released a lot of fresh water, that released a lot of um, mud into the water that kind of gummed up the, the ecosystem and the populations of those clams dropped off. Hmm. And so <clears throat> part of what we do in looking at, for biological indicators, it's kind of like environmental forensics. You're going out and, and you're looking for clues to try to explain what's going on. And so that requires a whole lot of, of looking at the entire community and then trying to find these individual species um, like the mayflies or the clams, and then um, tracking them over time. And so um, my analysis led me to identify this one little clam, and now I'm really going to be looking at it hard um, because I know it's going to tell me a lot about the um, health of the estuary moving forward. Yeah, bones of the benthos, super sleuthing the snails. Yep. We love, we love. Nice. <laughs> this is the third one I've done today. Um, okay, the last question I think we're going to have time for is a great question, and I doubt you'll, well, maybe you will, I don't know, maybe you'll surprise us. Um, an anonymous attendee wants to know, what's your favorite diet, Tom? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Which is hard because they're beautiful, um, and they have that silica glass shell, like you said. So if you haven't seen diet, Tom's, definitely Google image some pictures of them because they are stunning under the microscope. Yeah. I, it's hard to pick a favorite, but I, one that I end up drawing a lot when I'm doodling is, I have to share my screen so you guys can see it. I think I have a picture of it. Um, Great question. How did you know you would get her with that one, Anonymous? <laughs> so one of my favorites is um, Bedolphia and Odontella. They're two genera that look really similar and, and this is, I think this is Odontella, actually. Um, they're on the benthos, they form biofoams, but they also are up in the water column, so they're type of phytoplankton, and they're just super ornate, and they form these little chains, so they have hooks on the end of the cells, and they hook onto each other, and just form these big, long chains, and um, they're really beautiful. So that's probably my favorite, I guess. <laughs> no, that was a great question. Um, my friends, I guess that's really all the time we have today. Holly, thank you so much for your time today. And thanks to everyone for watching and for joining us and for sticking with us if you've been through the whole series with us. We really appreciate all your awesome questions. 
Um, before we go though, is there one final thing that you want to share with our audience? Um, if they like any closing advice that you'd like to give people if they want to follow a career path in marine science? Um, I would say just stay curious. Again, keep start asking questions and keep asking questions. There's so much information out there now. Like we were talking about Googling, you you know, question or answers to questions. You can find so much information at your fingertips. And um, to echo something that Michelle said last week in her career dive, there are no stupid questions. I've gotten in trouble with more than one teacher for for asking too many questions. But you know, if that happens to you, just don't don't listen to it because um, it's really important to be inquisitive. And that's part of being a great scientist. So if they have problem with you asking too many questions, it's probably because they don't know the answers and you obviously need to find someone else to ask your questions <laughs> to. So, and that's my advice. That's my personal experience. Um, but I, I really like that you, you said that. And I think that's come up in quite a few of the career dives about just keep, keep asking questions, keep finding out answers. Um, I know I used to feel when I was, when I was a young person in science that everything had already been studied and like what was the point because everybody knew everything already and I think something that you said that was really resonated with me was that the more you know the more you know that you don't know so there's always opportunities to just figure things out and then science is an evolving and adapting process you know it constantly changes and information as it presents itself and becomes available and we understand more about it so yeah. I think just keep asking questions is really really great advice and the more questions you ask the more you train your brain to come up with new questions it actually makes you at least this is my experience it makes you more inquisitive so if you start now when you're you're young and you come up with a list of questions that's just going to grow and grow and grow and you're always going to have work to do in your career practice makes perfect right like your brain i don't know that this is true but your brain's a muscle and you need to flex it and train it <laughs> Probably that's not. True. People who are like anatomy people are like, no, Laura, that's not real. Um, all right. So without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up because I'm getting silly now. So um, like I said, make sure you check out next week. It's going to be our final Career Dives Live Conversations in Marine Science for the summer. And it's going to be a really fun one. Like I said, Woody's going to be helping us um, build the frame for an underwater robot or a remotely operated vehicle, sometimes called an ROV. So make sure you check out that with us next week. Again, this, the last two, I apologize. Um, if you usually joined us at 10 a.m., this one was at 11 a.m. today, and next week's will also be at 11 a.m. But the lectures have been recorded. They're available on Facebook at any time, and they will be on our YouTube channel, which is Smithsonian SMS. You can also um, reach us on Twitter and Instagram at Smithsonian SMS if you have any questions or if you want to know more about the work that we're doing. Additionally, please make sure you subscribe for our newsletter. You can learn about Holly's work and a lot of the really cool work that's coming from the Marine Station and the Ecosystems Exhibit. So please make sure if you're not already, subscribe for our newsletter and you can stay up to date if we have any more digital programs like this one as well. Thank you guys so much and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, Holly. Thank you. Bye guys.